8. Aminata Diallo In November 2021, several members of the women's Paris Saint-Germain PSG soccer team went out to dinner. At the end of the night, midfielder Aminata Diallo drove three of her teammates home, including fellow midfielder Kira Hamraoui. Hamraoui was about to exit Diallo's car outside of her house when two masked men ambushed her and pulled her out of the vehicle. They beat her legs with iron bars in what police believe was an attempt to leave her with career-threatening injuries. While Hamraoui did require stitches and had to take some time off from the field, doctors determined that the damage wasn't permanent and that she would likely be able to resume playing soccer after she healed. The attack came at a time when Diallo and Hamraoui were vying for a spot on the national team, leading detectives to suspect that Diallo had orchestrated the assault as a way to eliminate her competition. A few days after the incident, PSG released a statement confirming that Diallo had been arrested in connection with the incident. The club reassured the public that it condemns all forms of violence and that it was cooperating with investigators in order to shed light on the facts of the case. In an unexpected twist, Diallo was released from police custody just 36 hours later, with no charges being filed against her. Weeks later, the wife of former soccer player Eric Abidal released a statement revealing that she was seeking a divorce from her husband after discovering that he was having an affair with Hamraoui. Abidal was working as PSG's sporting director when he and Hamraoui met. Hayat Abidal claimed that her husband had admitted to the affair, but he declined to comment or release a statement in response to the allegations. According to the last update, the assault against Hamraoui was still under investigation and law enforcement planned to question both Hayat and Eric Abidal. Diallo continues to play for the team, and the circumstances surrounding Hamraoui's attack remain shrouded in mystery. 7. Rashawn Jones Brian Patter had a promising career to look forward to as a professional football player, but he never got a chance to live out his dream. His talent attracted a lot of attention during his time playing for the Miami Hurricanes, who represent the University of Miami. He was just months away from most likely being drafted into the NFL when his life was suddenly cut short in 2006. Pata was returning to his off-campus apartment after practice one evening when someone fatally shot him in the head as he got out of his SUV. He was just 22 years old at the time of the incident. The police investigation dragged on for 15 years, during which time authorities released very little information to the public. For quite some time, they claimed that they hadn't identified any suspects. ESPN carried out an investigation into the case last year and found that detectives had long suspected Pat's former teammate, Rashawn Jones, of committing the murder. Their suspicions were based on a witness account and cell phone data, placing Jones near the murder scene even though he claimed he was at home that night. The two men also had an established history of not getting along, and Jones had been accused of threatening Patter in front of their teammates on at least one occasion. In a 2019 phone interview with news outlets, Jones denied any involvement in the crime. His wife, Ishenda, has also publicly maintained his innocence in the matter. However, those that were close to the victim knew something was off about Jones's story. The ESPN probe found evidence suggesting that Patter's family had questioned the Miami-Dade Police Department's dedication and ability to solve the case. When the agency refused the company's request for records on the case, ESPN sued them. They claimed that they should have access to the documents because the case was inactive and the record should be public. The department denied that the case was dormant and promised a renewed effort to bring Patter's killer to justice. Finally, in August of 2021, they charged 35-year-old Jones with murder. In a statement posted to Twitter, Detective Juan Segovia said that the case was finally solved after the right tip came in, causing the pieces to fall into place. Jones still pleads not guilty to this day and is currently awaiting trial. 6. Avery Chanel Medlock 25-year-old Avery Chanel Medlock was born a biological male but found her true identity as a woman. Unfortunately, many have trouble understanding and accepting transgender people and don't accept them as equals. Medlock was reminded of this reality recently when she attended cheerleading camp at Ranger College in the summer of 2022. A teammate allegedly began making transphobic and racist remarks toward her and an altercation followed. 
However, the exact details of what happened are unclear. Police wound up at the scene, and Medlock was accused of choking out one of her fellow cheerleaders. She reportedly told police that the attack was a joke, but they apparently didn't see it that way. They cited Medlock for assault, and she was removed from the campus. In a social media post, Medlock claimed that she was booted from her cheerleading squad for standing up for herself. She wrote that the girl she got into a confrontation with called her parents because she got scared. Medlock continued in her post, stating that the young woman's father was making remarks about she still has testosterone and male parts. Medlock also said that the father threatened to kill anyone who goes after his daughter. Her teammates gave her a different version of the story, accusing Medlock of blatantly assaulting the victim. Cell phone footage taken on the night of the incident shows several cheerleaders hiding in a room. They claimed that Medlock had gotten aggressive with them and that they barricaded themselves in the room because they feared for her safety. The father of the girl Medlock is accused of assaulting claimed in a Facebook post that he never made any comments about the suspect's race or gender. He implored Medlock to imagine what she might do if she received a call during the early morning hours that her child was in danger. While the truth about what happened remains somewhat of a mystery, the incident highlights the ongoing controversy surrounding transgender athletes participating in female sports. 18 states throughout the US have passed laws limiting transgender athletes to only play on teams of their birth sex rather than their gender identity. Whether this ordeal will be used to highlight the discrimination that transgender individuals face remains to be seen. 5. Perse Umbaka Houston police were recently called to the parking lot of a local soccer field in August 2022 after receiving a report of an altercation between two teammates. The attacker, 36-year-old Percy Umbaka, apparently became enraged when another player on the team lost the ball during the game. The victim said that Umbaka threatened to beat him until he was unrecognizable, leaving him feeling threatened and scared. Umbaka was disciplined by referees and given a red card for his aggressive conduct. After the game ended, someone struck the victim in the back of the head while he walked to his car. He turned around and was alarmed to see Umbaka with a lug wrench in his hand and a gun in his waistband. The suspect allegedly continued to challenge his teammate to a fight and said, step to me so I can pop you, but the victim did not engage. In the meantime, bystanders who'd witnessed the attack confronted Umbaka. According to police documents, instead of explaining himself, he got into his car and left the scene. The victim went to the hospital, bleeding and in severe pain from the blow to the head. He received stitches for the wound and has suffered from headaches ever since the attack. A spectator told officers that he's known Umbaka for five years and that he's known for having a short fuse when he doesn't get his way. Police charged Umbaka with one count of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. 4. College Confessions After graduating high school last year, Sean Fahey went on to play football for Norfolk State University in Virginia. While the school is known for its highly esteemed Division I team, Fahey has accused his teammates of giving him the exact opposite of a dignified welcome. The former lineman went public with his story earlier this year, claiming that he was sexually assaulted and hazed by the team. He reported the incidents, but later said that the coaches failed to respond compassionately. Instead, those in charge told him that he was risking his career by raising these issues. To make matters worse, Fahey reported that staff members shared sensitive information about the incidents with the team, leading to further embarrassment and shame. During a press conference, he said that he regretted taking the NSU scholarship over others that he had been offered and made it clear that he will never play football for the university again. Fahey's lawyer, Diane Toscano, said that the coaches were well aware of the harassment and that other students have reported similar experiences. She described some of the disturbing ways that older players allegedly victimized freshmen. She implied that school officials turned a blind eye to the abuse instead of protecting the victims. Toscano said that she and Fahey are now exploring his legal options. She is also raising awareness about the hazing problem among college football teams and has even founded a non-profit dedicated to the cause called Goal Line Stand Together. However, the determined lawyer is aware that the fight will be an uphill battle. 3. Danielle Potterfoot 
22-year-old Danielle Potterford moved to the United States from England to attend the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut so she could play on the school's soccer team. Just a few weeks shy of her scheduled graduation in 2015, she became aggressive with another player after the team's end-of-season banquet. Potterfoot was upset that her teammate, Nicola Worthington, received the Coach's Player Award. The disgruntled athlete began complaining about how she was a senior and hadn't received any awards in her four years on the team. It was clear that she thought she deserved recognition, and her teammates later said that she left the banquet early and was very drunk. Things got violent during an after-banquet dorm party when Putterfoot allegedly charged at fellow soccer player 18-year-old Haley Marquis. She was accused of headbutting the young woman, knocking her over chairs and onto the floor. The assault left Marquis with two black eyes, a concussion, and swelling on the right side of her face. Witnesses reported that after she attacked Haley, Putterfoot began slamming her head against a closet. When bystanders tried to intervene, she allegedly shoved another woman into a wall. Haley received treatment for her injuries at a local hospital, while police charged Potterford with third-degree assault. A judge granted her accelerated rehabilitation, which stated she would need to complete one year of probation in order to drop the charges against her. The judge also ordered Potterford to perform 100 hours of community service in the UK and to have no contact with her victim. At her sentencing, Haley read a victim impact statement accusing the court of going too easy on her attacker. She said that she didn't think Potterfoot should ever be allowed back into the country and demanded that she be ordered to write a letter of apology. However, Potterfoot refused to apologize and stood by her claims that she never did anything wrong to begin with. 2. Senseless Act of Violence In December of 2021, paramedics found a teenage boy unconscious and bleeding from his ears outside a Texas house party that they had been called to. The 16-year-old Cole Hagen suffered multiple skull fractures and a broken collarbone as a result of the senseless crime. According to an arrest affidavit, three of the young man's football teammates lured him away from the party by telling him that something was wrong with his truck. Once they got him outside, they allegedly beat him and then left him there in the street. One of the victim's friends then received a text message from one of the suspects telling him to get his boy. The teen was rushed to the hospital and put on a ventilator, while his family and friends prayed that he would survive. Luckily, he pulled through and has returned to school, but faces a long road to recovery, along with some lifelong injuries. Several months after the incident, a grand jury indicted 18-year-old Aidan Holland and two 17-year-old suspects on aggravated assault charges. In the meantime, the boys' families filed a $50 million lawsuit aimed at the teens and their families. The suit accused several individuals of knowing about the attack ahead of time and failing to take action to prevent it from happening. Both cases are expected to proceed to trial sometime in the near future. 1. High School Hazing Horror It's no secret that hazing is popular among college athletic teams, but it's also a problem in some high schools. Late last year, news headlines reported on a family's lawsuit against a private Catholic school near Los Angeles, where their son was seriously injured during a hazing incident. Initial reports described how the boy suffered a broken nose and brain damage after an incident that occurred in early 2021. Apparently, he had been forced to fight a much larger member of the school's nationally renowned football team in a locker room. This is allegedly a long-standing tradition at Mater Day and involves two team members punching each other until one gives up. According to the teen's family, who spoke with the Los Angeles Times, athletes who decline to participate in the ritual are alienated and punished by their teammates. The lawsuit accuses staff members of trying to cover up the incident by failing to call paramedics and not informing the boy's family of his injuries for at least 90 minutes. Shortly after the lawsuit broke, the school's president, Walter Jenkins, stepped down. A spokesperson said that his decision to resign had nothing to do with the highly publicized scandal. Months later, a police document revealed that the victim also accused a teammate of making unwanted advances towards him in a disturbing locker room assault. His family claims that the school's football coach knew that hazing and other abuse was going on between teammates and did nothing. He allegedly even told the boy's father that he'd be a rich man if he received $100 every time he heard about these types of incidents. 
However, when questioned by police, the coach denied any knowledge of the team's initiation rituals. Parents and the community have rallied around the popular coach, and the district attorney has made it clear that he does not intend to file criminal charges. Although the school's former athletic director has accused the coach of mishandling the situation from the get-go and responding only with silence. In a sworn deposition, she claimed the coach even yelled at her and told her to stop asking questions while she investigated the case. She stated that she found it odd that her concern for students' well-being generated such an explosive reaction. The victim has since transferred schools, and a trial date for the lawsuit has yet to be scheduled. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be a professional football star or a professional soccer star? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time. Bye.